the, the actual theme of this, uh, of this talk is about carrying shame and how that can steal away our identity in Christ. <clears throat> Here is a dictionary of sh definition of shame. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the co co <coughs> sorry, caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behaviour, of appearing ridiculous, or of having offended against propriety. I think we've probably all carried shame at some time, whether that's something we've done or something that has been put upon us. For example, women who have been raped often feel shame, as if it were their fault it had happened. Shame can be laid down as a negative self-evaluation in messages we've received from others. For example, a repeated comment by an adult to a child, like, you'll never be a whatever. We also say things like, what a shame so-and-so can't be here. To be ashamed of a wrongdoing is not in itself wrong. It's the expression of guilt for the offence. But holding on to that shame after confessing the deed and receiving God's forgiveness does actually form a barrier between God and the offender. There are plenty of references to shame in the Bible, but the one in the reading from Genesis is probably the easiest for us to relate to, as we know it well. Before the fall, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it tells us that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So it was something that arrived in human nature after the submission to temptation by Satan that caused them to feel shame. Satan took the form of a serpent and deceived the woman, as is his nature, to break the one rule that God had laid down for mankind. God had created a paradise where all kinds of trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food for the man he had created to live in, known as the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 it says, And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will surely die. Notice that God said, when you eat it, not if you eat it. Also note, he did not say, it will kill you if you eat it. He said, when you eat it, you will surely die. It would seem then that God's intention was for the man to live forever. But through disobedience, when he ate the fruit, his lifespan was limited. It was after that that God created the woman. Now I have a particular dislike of snakes. I had to be brave to watch them behind glass in the zoo when my children were young, uh, but I still have to brace myself to do it. I think it's the way they move that unnerves me most. My older brother took me for a walk in the woods where we lived in Kent when I was about six or seven and terrified me by chasing after a snake he'd come across. I hope it wasn't an adder. Satan, in the form of a crafty, slithering snake, twisted the meaning of God's commandment in his temptation of the woman. I think the characterization of Carl the Python in the film ad adaptation of Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book was so clever. The way he moved and the accentuation and elongation of the S's in his speech were so apt as he mesmerised the boy Mowgli. 
That's how I envisage the serpent bewitching the woman when he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? We all know that she believed Satan, ate the forbidden fruit and gave some to the man, who also should have known and done better. That one act of disobedience cost us all. There, is no, there was no such thing as sin before that. It put an eternal barrier between man and God, which he paid for in our stead by the death of his only son, Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. It opened their eyes to the fact that they were naked and they were the first people to feel shame. They covered their nakedness with leaves, but they couldn't cover their shame. And that shame wasn't just about being naked. They felt guilt that they had disobeyed God. And that also brought shame into their relationship with him. It was marred forever. If you remember, Lorraine gave us a long list of identity statements at the beginning of the series of talks on our identity in Christ, which began in April. Now, you'll be relieved to know that I am not going to, don't propose to go through them all, but I have picked out a few that are relevant to how we deal with shame. I have an annoying bad habit that goes on in my head of which I am ashamed. I have confessed it to a total stranger at a Christian conference. So much easier than speaking to someone you know well. I know it's a cop out. And I know I am forgiven by God because, as it says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But I am human and I live in a sinful world and I find it almost impossible to shake the habit. And Satan just loves to remind us of where we've gone wrong, doesn't he? Even the Apostle Paul struggled with doing stuff he didn't want to do and knew he shouldn't. Read about it in his letter to the Romans, chapter 7. But in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, he says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, we are set free from sin by the Holy Spirit. How do we deal with the shame that's been laid on us by other people? There are more I am statements to help us. Ephesians 2.10 says, I am God's workmanship, created for good works. Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. John 15.16, I have been chosen and appointed by God to bear fruit. Finally, here's one to use in your defence against Satan and all his wiles. 1 John 5 verse 18. I am born of God and the evil one cannot touch me. We can overcome shame and the temptation to hold on to it. James 4 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I have used that tactic many times, especially in the night when I've woken up with dreadful thoughts going through my head. Just tell him in the power of the Holy Spirit to beat it and he is instantly powerless. He knows that he has been defeated by our Lord. And of course, St. Paul gave us the practical armour of God in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand 
against the devil's schemes. He goes on to detail the armour in the following verses. Now I am aware that I've used a lot of Bible references this morning, uh, this evening. <laughs> That's because the Bible is my work stroke life manual. It's so important to keep reading it. I'm hopeless, <coughs> excuse me, I'm hopeless at remembering where to find relevant passages, so I rely heavily on a concordance to guide me, or Google. You don't need the exact words to find a reference online. I had an interesting conversation with my very wise pastor son in Hungary on Friday. He wanted to know what I was doing this weekend. And when I told him about this talk, he said, just tell them that Jesus didn't ever leave anyone feeling shame. He healed and forgave many people who could have carried shame. For example, to the woman found in adultery, he just said, go now and leave your life of sin. To the Samaritan woman at the well, who had numerous partners, he pointed her towards a future of worshipping in spirit and truth. To the prostitute who anointed, anointed him with expensive perfume, he said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Even to those who had nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus doesn't change. He doesn't want his brothers and sisters, which is what we are, to be burdened by carrying shame. So we have identified what shame is and where it came from. We have acknowledged the damage that carrying shape can bring, shame can bring, and how we can deal with it. And we have briefly looked again at some I am statements that affirm our identity in Christ and enable us to stand firm in faith. In conclusion, I am going to guide us in a short time of quiet reflection. If you are carrying shame in any form, hand it over to God now. Don't let it steal your identity in Christ. Holy Spirit, come and free your people. And remember, as it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.